In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, well, good morning. Happy New Year. How's everybody doing? All right. We just watched the ball drop central time because, like, it's an arbitrary line anyway. So we've, we, we, we rang in the New Year at, on our schedule. So I want to welcome you uh, this morning. If you're a visitor uh, and this is your first time, uh, thank you for being with us. We're just honored that you're here. If you haven't filled out one of those uh, Connect cards right in front of you, we have a, a gift for you. If you'll turn that in at the, the table up front, free t-shirt for you and everybody, member of your family. Uh, if you're a regular here, go ahead and check in on social media. For every check-in in in the month of January, we're going to give a dollar to World Missions. Um, And also, in just about a month, we're going to be having our annual vision meeting. That's February 5th. That is not Super Bowl Sunday, in case anybody's thinking we're we're that crazy. (laughs) It's going to be the week in between, I think, the last game and the next. So, But anyway, it's going to be February 5th. If you want to nominate somebody to serve on our board of directors, uh, you have a couple of weeks to do that. I think it's two weeks before the meeting is the cutoff day. Uh, How many remember when you were were young... You, you, your mom or your dad had like some, some door somewhere in your house that they would make a mark and about how tall you were, right? Mine ended when I was about 12, so I just had to settle for being good looking. That's okay. I can't be tall, but, um, and I was okay with that. You know, if you know my wife, she's taller than me. I'm fine with that. Never thought about it too much, but there is a, an area of growth we really should be talking about, and that is our spiritual growth. And January 1st is an awesome time to do a couple of things. The Bible says we are to examine ourselves. In other words, we're supposed to make an an assessment of ourselves regularly to see where we are, as Paul says, in Christ. But also, it's a great time to set goals. How many know if you don't set a goal, you'll never achieve a goal? Now, one of the things we do at the vision meeting, I, I do this every year, is I set goals for what we want to accomplish as a church. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think I've ever accomplished every goal we've set for the church, which is fine. We always accomplish most of them, but I always want to set those goals a little bit hard. I want to make them a little bit difficult to force me to stretch as a leader, to force the church to stretch. And this is what I want to talk to you today about. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture Paul is dealing with a church, it's, it's a little bit unusual because, now Romans, he didn't know the church, uh, he'd only heard about them. Galatians, uh, Corinthians, those churches were some churches with some real serious problems. But the church in Thessalonica was actually a pretty mature church. They were growing in a healthy way, they were supporting Paul on his missionary endeavors. And so Paul writes them in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 1. He says, finally, brethren, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For, we know, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. In other words, this comes through man, but it comes from Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter you should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life. Therefore he who rejects this instruction does not reject man but God. The very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to receive the instruction. We thank you for your counsel. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to spiritually make a mark on the wall. Lord, we want to grow in Jesus Christ in 2023. We want to be more prayerful. We want to be more faithful. We want to be more generous. We want to be more loving. God, we want to be more like Jesus Christ at the end of this year than we are at the beginning of it. So I pray, Father, that you use this word to bring us to a place not only of of evaluation, but also, Lord, where we can see your heart more perfectly, Lord, and walk in your will, walk in your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, 2022 is behind us. Uh, God's purposes for your life in 2022 have either been completed or they haven't been. There is no rewind button. And so what I do at the beginning of each year is encourage people to make that proverbial spiritual mark on the wall. Maybe even literally write down, Where am I in my walk with Jesus? But in some way, 
make an examination of where you are, note it to see how you're doing as far as your personal growth. Because I'll tell you, goals, if you don't set them, you'll never reach them. Organizations that don't set them don't know if they're thriving, they're surviving, they're doing well. You're just sort of drifting. And one thing I know about our walk with Jesus is God did not call us to just sort of devolve into religion where we just keep doing a ritual and wait for Jesus to get here. We are called disciples, meaning that God is using each year of your life to prepare you more perfectly for the man or woman that you will be in eternity. God has a literal kingdom that we are called to be citizens of, and so he gives us his word so that we can develop more perfectly into citizens of the, that kingdom. So if we're not in the habit of realistically and honestly assessing where we are in Christ and of setting goals of where we want to get to, we will almost assuredly not get there. So allow me to challenge you as we begin to do that. Think about where you were <clears throat> a year ago. What was your prayer life like? What were your giving habits? What was your time in the Word like? What was your personal worship, your faithfulness to God's household? Uh, you know, I have not, and, and not just because I'm, I'm a Christian leader, I have not in decades woken up on a Sunday, whether I've been uh, in, in the pulpit or not, woken up thinking, should I go to church or not? I made that decision 30 years ago, that when Sunday rolls around, I'll be in church. I have a good buddy who used to lead our men's group, and he would say, it's easier to make one decision than 52. And so what I'm asking you today is not to, not to become somebody who's making decisions all the time. Should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? What you should do is be asking yourself, where am I not measuring up? to where God has called me to be in terms of faithfulness, in terms of generosity, in terms of my understanding of the word. Because I'll tell you this, we are none of us called to be spectators in the kingdom, in, in, in the economy of the kingdom. We are all called to be servants. And I know as a Christian leader that a man or a woman who knows the word, a man or woman who is in prayer, a man or a woman who is generous and knows how to release the things of this earth, a man or a woman who seeks servanthood, that person is going to be incredibly beneficial to the growth of God's kingdom, and especially this little part of it that we call the Bridge Church. And so what we should do is be thinking about where we were a year ago, and then ask ourselves, have I grown measurably in these 12 months? Did I, in 2022, grow measurably as a servant of God, as a follower of Jesus in my prayer life? Did I grow measurably in my ability to release things for the kingdom of God? Did I grow measurably in my understanding of the word? It's not about beating ourselves up, but the truth is that muscles aren't used, aren't there to be used when they need to be used. My wife's grandmother lived to be almost 100 years old, and about the time she was 90, 91, 92, she took a fall, and I think she broke her hip, and she was in a wheelchair for a while. Now, that injury healed up, but she never walked again because she didn't use, do the therapy that she needed to do, and so she spent the rest of her life in that wheelchair unnecessarily. And many of us as Christians, we're doing the same things. We're letting our muscles atrophy. The Bible says, discipline yourself unto godliness. So when I was a young Christian and God called me to tithe, I did that. Why? What I found was that later on, when there was a need, when somebody I cared about or somebody in the church or even a stranger had a need and God said, I want you to give to that, it was easy to release. I, I, God called me to pray. And so what happens now is when I come across a situation where, where somebody needs prayer, it's easy for me to say, hey, can I pray for you? because I've built those muscles up. And the reason that this is so important, and while I'll probably continue to do this is, until Jesus comes, is because of an immutable spiritual principle, and that is that God does not allow stagnation. We know that from the book of Revelation. He said, would that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, right? You go to drink, a, 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 you think it's hot coffee and it's lukewarm, Ugh, nasty. You want a nice cold soda on a hot day, you drink it, it's like lukewarm, mm-mm. That's why Jesus said, if you're cold or hot, I, I could do something with you. you. You'd serve some purpose. But because you are lukewarm, I'll spit you out. And that word in the Greek actually means vomit. It's, it's, it's not an intentional thing. Nobody, nobody says, you know what, I think I'm going to just go throw up right now. 
right? You're like, I remember being on a cruise ship, and we had like 25-foot waves. And this girl comes walking into the dining hall, and she is just like dressed to impress. She wants everybody. Well, she gave everybody a show. I tell you what, you know, I'm watching. I'm like, she ain't going to make it. She ain't going to make it. She didn't make it, right? I turned to my wife's dinner and a show, right? I mean, you, 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 you dress, I'm, I'm just, I'm kidding, but maybe. But, but the, the, the truth is that God does not allow, it's just, it's just contrary to his nature for us to stagnate. I was part of a church, and, and we just blown up, and we'd fill it, it was, it was a small building, and, and we just blown up and filled it up, and I said, look, we need to think about selling this building and move to a bigger building. We were bedroom to Boston, we were about 40 minutes outside of town, probably could have got over a million bucks for that piece of property. It was right on, in a commercial district, we could have sold it and, and moved, and we'd grown to the point, we didn't have to be right on this main artery anymore. And, and actually, there were people who said some things like, but look, I mean, we're gonna have to give more, and at the end of the day, so we have this new building. It's going to be the same praise team. It's going to be the same preacher. In other words, my experience isn't going to change. So what, why, should, why should I lock into this? And it's like, because there's a lot of lost people out there. And it told me that those people who said that just did not have the heart of Jesus Christ to reach the lost, to reach the world with the gospel message. See, Paul tells us in, in Romans 1.28, the sin begins with, with this kind of apathetic understanding or, or mindset about God. He says, they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. So they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy. He, just, he lists all these sins, and then he says, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. And so there's this progression where it begins with this kind of apathetic mindset about spiritual things, and it proceeds into wickedness. Now, C.S. Lewis said, a thing becomes more of what it already is, right? So if you're on, your, on the way to righteousness and you're on the path to righteousness, you're expected to grow and grow and grow and become more and more righteous, as, as the, the Word of God just told us. But what, it, what the Word also tells us is that if we develop an apathetic mindset about the things of God, we'll proceed into more and more wickedness. And we see this happening in the church in this generation. I just talked to somebody after the, the, the early service, and they were talking about another church they used to attend, and they said they just keep jettisoning all these biblical truths, and they've embraced all these, these falsehoods. And I remember, I remember being in New England, which, by the way, that was the original Bible Belt, guys. Right? And I would pass all these buildings that used to be churches, and now they're like art studios, and, and, and they're like storage areas, and, and things like that. And I remember passing this one church, and, and it had been there for hundreds of years. And it had been a Bible-preaching, gospel-believing church. And then they put up on their sign, proclaiming the teachings of Jesus and other great religious leaders. Within three years, the word Jesus was off their sign. It just progressed into more and more unbiblical teaching. See, the flip side of that is when we make it our aim to add the character of God to our lives, he works to grow that in us as well. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities, listen to this, in increasing measure... They'll keep you be from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at the beginning of the passage that we read in 1 Thessalonians, Paul makes a statement, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And if you go through the scripture, that question is asked whether it's in, in one form or another, whether it's the, the Jews receiving the law or on the day of Pentecost, what do we need to do? In response to what God has said, What's my responsibility? What do I need to do? And so Paul is saying, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And this is something that we need to, to really make a, a differentiation about in our own thinking because so many people are so hung up on the love of God, the grace of God, right? They've misdefined grace to doing what they, they want to do. And they believe that grace is just like the empowerment of, of God just to, you know, just to ignore it and wink at our sin. The Bible tells us that grace gives us the empowerment to do the higher call. And so when you say something like, well, I'm not under law, but I'm under grace, that, that should make you tremble a little bit. Because Jesus said, under the law, it was said, don't commit adultery. But, I, but now under the new covenant, under grace, don't even lust in your heart. But, but Jesus, I, how, how am I supposed to do this? The law says, don't murder anybody. But I say that if you've got anger in your heart toward your brother, you're already a murderer in your heart. 
how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do that? Because grace gives us the empowerment to live at a higher level. It doesn't, it's not, it's not some, some cosmic, you know, like filter where God can no longer see the stuff that we do and, and which empowers us to live as we've always lived. Paul is saying, I instructed you how to live in order to please God. And so for a lot of us, we need to flip the script and go beyond God loves me. Of course God loves you. Of course God loves everybody. There's nobody, though, that ends up eternally condemned that God didn't love. That's the thing. So if we get hung up on just one dynamic and we ignore or we become apathetic to the, to the other truths, we're bringing serious trouble into our lives. And so Paul says, look, flip the script here. Move beyond, like we talked about the other week, move beyond this basic God loves me and move into, okay, so how do I live in order to please God? In order to please God. Because each of us has the capacity to choose to engage in actions that either please or grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we talked about last, night, last week in Ephesians 4. That we have the, the power, the ability to grieve the Spirit of God. But Paul says we also have the ability to live to please God. So what I want to do is I want to show you three areas that the Holy Spirit is dealing with in this text. And ask that as we move through them, we kind of we remain in that mindset of introspection and evaluation and ask ourselves, how do I measure up in each one of these areas that this text is talking about? Now the first is avoiding deliberate, intentional temptation. That's what he says in verse 3. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. Now if we just end it there, we think, oh, well, that's something God does for us, right? That's, you know, that's an experience we have. But look at, look at how the verse continues. That you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own way, your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. In other words, the Bible says it's God's will that you should be sanctified, but then goes into detail as to what that means. And what Paul is saying is sanctification necessitates effort on the part of the children of God. We need to avoid immorality. Now, why is this first? Because if you don't sanctify your surroundings as far as possible for you to do, you're going to continue to wrestle with temptation on an ever-increasing scale. Look, if I talk to some couple, right, and maybe there's been an affair, and I'll talk to the, maybe the, maybe the husband had an affair, and I'll talk to him and I'll say, all right, how did you pay for that hotel? And your wife not find out. Oh, well, I have this credit card and she didn't know about it. All right, how did you communicate? Oh, I have this secondary number on my phone, and my wife didn't. Now, probably when those things were happening, he wasn't even thinking about, I'm going to use this so that I can engage in sin. But what was going on is that an environment, an atmosphere was being created for sin to flourish. Look, the enemy can only go but so far and no further in terms of his temptation of you. But if he gaslights you into creating an environment in your own life that you make yourself susceptible to sin, then he's got you because he doesn't have to tempt you. You're, you're, you're walking down that road. And so avoiding immorality doesn't mean just don't get into an impure relationship. It means do an inventory and see if there are things in your life that cause you to be weaker than you need to be. I've seen this with, with people who wrestle with, with lust and impure fantasies, pornographic images. And, and you might say something like, well, hey, man, how, how am I supposed to control the thoughts that pop into my head? How am I supposed to, to control the dreams I have at night? And I say, you've got this all backwards. See, when I go home and I turn on the TV, I don't think that there's like little actors in my TV like that actually live there that are portraying this show for me. The TV is a mechanism for the signal to be broadcast and interpreted. Same thing with your brain. You don't have a soul, you are a soul. And this body is what we drive around, this brain is how we perceive this world. The Bible tells us we're going to get a new physical body. It's gonna have a perfected mind. It won't be able to get sick, it won't die. That's gonna happen, that's in our future right now. We're driving around these vessels that are part of this decaying, lost world. And so Paul is saying, look, you need to learn to control that. You don't just put somebody behind the wheel of a car that's like eight years old. with no. You need to learn. You need to be mature enough, but you also need to learn. 
And it's the same thing if you wanted to pilot a plane. You wouldn't just say, you know, go down to Hertz rent a plane and say, give me, a, give me an airplane and I'm just going to start flying this thing around. You have to learn. And so your brain is the processor for this body that you cruise around in. And so the thought life you have, even the dreams you have, are a product of the environment you live in. They're a product of the environment you live in. When, when we take stock of our surroundings, especially what's in our homes, and we discover things like movies with nudity, language that's out of bounds for Christians, dirty jokes, and so on, we're not even usually aware how these things are affecting. I had a buddy, and um, he was a single guy, and, and he would come home, you know, he'd throw his dinner in the microwave or anything, turn on the TV, and he said one night he's watching the show. He's not even kind of, you know how we do it sometimes. We're in it like kind of mindlessly just you know, flip something on, you know, throw something in the microwave. And he sits down, he's eating his food. And he says he was laughing along with the sitcom and he said it hit him. Romans 1 hit him. Not only are, do they do these things, they approve of those who do them. And he said, you know, I may not have been engaging in that behavior, but I'm sitting here supporting it. And believe me, <laughs> Dish, DirecTV, your cable company, all that, they know what shows you're watching. And they promote content based on what we watch. And so if we're just absorbing the things of the world and we're normalizing that mindset. See, I, I, I understand when, when I'll talk to, you know, my parents or whatever. And they talk about how things were when they grew up. I was sharing with somebody last week. My mom and dad went to a state university. State university. Still there. They went to a state university as adults. They had to get parental, written parental permission to date because he was Catholic and she was Methodist. That's how much our culture has changed just in one lifetime. One lifetime, right? So if you messed up just, just maybe 80 years ago, 75 years ago, you messed up like three blocks away, your friend's mama would whoop you, grab you by the arm, take you home to present you to your mama who would whoop you. Then they'd have coffee and say, wait till your father comes home, Right? We don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in, they, this world doesn't even give lip service. We are a post-Christian culture. For the first time, if you take all, every belief system, not just Christian, we you take Christians, Buddhists, Islamics, Mormons, Catholic, all together, add them all up, still the minority in the United States in terms of church attendance or religious attendance. We're for the, and that's the first time. That happened during COVID for the first time in the history of our country. That's the world we live in. It's a post-Christian culture. We need to recognize that. We need to act accordingly. The world is not our friend. The culture is not our friend. It will not help us. It will not even give lip service to right and wrong. And so Paul says, the first thing you need to do is learn how to please God. Sanctify yourself. In other words, take assessment of your environment your home, your life, and, and ask yourself, is this pleasing to God? The second thing he tells us to do, and he says this is a learned behavior, self-control. He says that you should, verse 4, learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honorable. It is God's will that each of you learn, meaning this is not something that's natural to us. And many of us, we make the mistake, we come down, we bow at the altar, we accept Jesus Christ, and we just sort of think, you know what, this is all just going to come naturally to us. And sometimes 5, 10, 15 year, years later, I'll see Christians, and I've been a Christian leader long enough, man, it's just all rules, and it's just all opinion, and it's just all style. And if they've developed just a critical spirit, they've developed a cynical spirit. There's nothing about the joy of the Lord of, in them. They're, they've never won anybody. They don't invite anybody to Jesus. Their prayer life isn't deepening. Because they made a faulty assumption that this sort of stuff would just happen when the Bible says it's a learned behavior. Jesus didn't mince words when it came to temptation. He says in Luke 17, 1, things that cause people to sin are bound to come, meaning that's going to happen. But woe to that person through whom they come. We have a tendency to say that's the world. But that could be us too. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of those, these little ones to sin. Now, if Jesus has never said that and I said that, y'all be thinking, man, this guy is just off the reservation, man. He's just, what is he thinking about saying? It'd be better if you cause somebody to sin, it'd be better, like, like the mafia would say, to have cement shoes and be tossed off the side of a boat. That's what Jesus is saying. 
Because he understands the economy of heaven in a way we never will till we get there. And so when we look at that word in verse 4, learn, it means that self-control, even for the Christian, is not only a fruit of the Spirit, it is a learned behavior. And so we need to look at the things in our lives that cause us to behave in ways that are inconsistent with our testimony about Christ. If I've learned anything over 20 plus years of Christian leadership, it's that we have an almost limited, limitless capacity to absolve ourselves of sin. We can acknowledge a behavior is sinful, but if we want to participate in it, we can somehow rationalize it. Whether that's drunkenness, sex outside of marriage, profanity, addiction, all of these are clearly condemned and out of bounds for the Christian in the Word of God. But many still not only engage in them, they will advocate for them. They will argue with you. If you try to bring it up to them and say, hey man, that's just out of bounds, they will literally argue with you or say something. I knew of a guy who uh, he was a pastor and, and he found out that one of his elders was having an affair. And so, you know, he finds this out in the morning. It's like, it's like quarter to, to nine. And so he calls the guy on his cell phone and he's like, hey, I just heard this. Is this true? And he's hoping, no, I'm going to hear no. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. The guy says, yeah, it's true. The pastor says, all right, well, obviously, I know there's not time to talk about it now. You're on your way to work. We need to talk, but I just want you to know I'm, I'm removing you from, from all ministry until, it, until you go through a restoration process, uh, uh, until that marriage has been healed. I'm, I'm removing you. And this guy just begins to argue, well, who do you think you are? What, do you think you're perfect? Do you think I'm the only one in the church? He is acknowledging his sin, and then he's trying to justify it. And Jesus talks about, when he, when he talks about that, that parable of the good Samaritan, and Samaritans were the most hated people. These were the people that, that had corrupted Judaism. These were the people, if you go back in the Old Testament, the, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so for generations, they had worshipped at these golden calf idols, and they had polluted Judaism that way. And then after they were defeated, they... they the, the, the king that defeats them takes about 90% of them out and puts all these other people from all these pagan lands and they intermix and they have all these different cultures and the Bible talks about, you know, they even sent some of the false priests back to teach them how to worship God, which they weren't even worshiping God. And so it got really, really corrupted and perverted. And so by the time of Jesus' day, these Samaritans were seen as dangerous to be around. You think of the person that, that would make you most uncomfortable in church, that's a Samaritan times 10. And Jesus uses that person as the hero. Why? Because you go back in that story, and, and, and the guy's saying, basically, how do I get saved? What do I need to do to, to, to be right with God? And Jesus gives them the basic, well, you need to love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on this. And the Bible says these words, but he wanting to justify himself. Okay, yeah, but, but who's my neighbor? Let's, let's bring this down to like a manageable, no. Jesus just blows that up and says, there was this Samaritan. That would have got everybody's attention as if Jesus would have said, you know, there was this transgender, trans, transgender dude. What, what? That's the hero of your story? There was this atheist, you know, pro, pro-choice activist that, what? That's the hero of your story? And, and Jesus just really got their attention because he knew that we have this limitless capacity to try to justify our own sin, justify our own limitations. God is calling us higher. God is calling us to elevate. I promise you, I don't know, this could be your first time in church. This could be the first time you've ever heard the gospel, or you could be in church for 30 years. I guarantee you, God is not calling anybody to stagnate in 2023. He's calling every single one of us to elevate over this next year. Draw closer to me. Become more effective. You may look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm never going to be effective for Jesus. I've been trying this long enough. I'm never going to do this. That is not God talking. God is not saying to anybody, you are going to be ineffective and that's my will. It is God's will. You should be sanctified. Set apart is what that word means. Set apart for his purposes. Look at verse 7. God did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life. Therefore, remember what I said last week, when you see the word therefore, ask what is therefore, because these two thoughts connect. He who rejects this instruction doesn't reject man, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So God wants us to live in and not just visit 
holiness. Live in and not just visit holiness. Sometimes we come to church and we visit holiness, right? We become worshipers when the songs are playing. God wants us to live there. God wants you to be a holy man or woman, someone who walks in his righteousness. And just getting stuff out of your house and out of your life doesn't make you holy. It's a good start. It's a necessary start. But if I wanted, if I wanted Coca-Cola in this bottle, and it's a full bottle of water, and I just started pouring Coca-Cola in until it looks more like Coke than water, you'd say I was out of my mind. You've got to empty out the vessel. See, that's what repentance is. Repentance isn't what makes you holy. Repentance is what prepares the space for God to fill. That's why Jesus said, it's for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, I'm not going to be able to send the Holy Spirit. If I go away, I will send the Spirit to you. And so the Holy Spirit is what gives us the power we can now have within us, the character and nature of God. So just getting stuff out, and there's, there's Christians who try to do that. Man, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't hang with those who do. Great. That don't make you holy. That don't make you righteous. So ask yourself, where am I in each of these areas of servanthood? Prayer. Genuine personal worship. Daily time in the Word. Giving. Can you say that these things are being added in ever-increasing measure to your life? And in what way? See, this isn't about becoming more religious. This is about becoming more like Jesus who excelled in each of them. You know where Jesus was on the Sabbath day? In church. That's what the Bible says. He was in the synagogue, which was the local church, as was his custom. We know that Jesus had a dynamic and powerful prayer life that his followers couldn't keep up with. Even the ones who had walked with him for years said, teach us to pray. I mean, I, I thought we knew how to pray. I grew up Jewish. I thought I knew how to pray. But watching you, Jesus, I don't know how to pray. Jesus was a generous and loving Savior. Matter of fact, we talked about that last week. It was the defining characteristic of who God was. God so loved the world that he gave. That he gave. He was prayerful. He knew the word. Twelve years old. Twelve years old. He's already arguing with the rabbis in the synagogue about the word of God. And so this is the funny thing. We think we can become like Christ without becoming like Christ. I'm going to become like Jesus without becoming like Jesus. If I want to become like Jesus, I have to, the Bible says, discipline myself unto godliness. So I don't, I don't tithe to impress God. I just made a decision years ago I was going to do that. And you know what happened? I begin to build the muscle. And guess what? When God taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, there's a need over here, it's not painful for me to release things of this world because I know something greater. He said, every time I lay up treasure on earth, I'm, I, I'm laying it up in heaven. Every time I release it on earth, I'm laying it up in heaven. Every time I pray in my prayer closet, when I was, when I was young in the Lord, God began, before I was called to, called to preach, I was called to preach in 1990, so you can tell I was three years old. And, and, um, and God began to put into me a prayer life that I thought, man, so, so God says, I want you to start praying an hour a day. So I grabbed my guitar, I grabbed my Bible, right? Cause, and, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. I didn't say devotions. I said prayer. I said prayer. You can worship me also at, another, at other times. And I expect you to be in the Word. But I want you to pray this much every day so it becomes habit. And you build the muscle. So now when somebody crosses my path with a need, let's pray right here. It's natural. And that's what God wants to do. It's not that that religious stuff makes me holy. But that religious stuff makes me more pliable and useful to God as a servant of his kingdom. See, unless I add more Jesus to my life, the other religious exercise, just getting stuff out of my home, just controlling myself and exercising and learning self-control, if I'm not adding more Jesus to my life, those are just going to be exercises in spiritual pride. Jesus himself said he did nothing, nothing, except that he saw the Father doing. Hebrews... Um, Hebrews 12, 14 says, and, and, and listen to this, we're going to wind down. But Hebrews 12, 14 says this, Make every effort to live in peace with all men. It doesn't say you're going to be able to, but as much as possible for you, Scripture says. And to be holy. Now, if it was just ending there, it'd be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's good advice. But then it says this, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
Now, I promise you, if there was a verse in Scripture that said, without faithful church attendance, no one will see the Lord, it would be the most preached verse of Scripture in the history of preaching, right? <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. You're like, I can't believe you just said that, preacher. I'm just being real with you. If there was a verse that said it, it would get preached a couple of times a month because there would be a tangible benefit to the church. But here's a verse that tells us, without holiness... We will not see God. We often just pass it by. We often don't meditate on that like we should. God said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with part of your heart, right? With all your heart. Not when you seek me for a couple minutes at the end of a message or when you have some free time. So the question is, do you want to end 2023 a better and different man or woman in the sight of God? Now, if you don't, I got nothing to say to you. I really don't. I, I, I still love you. Look, I, I'll be honest with you. My bed is not going to become any more lumpy based on what you do. My food is not going to be more stale based on what you do. My call, what God has said. I told somebody after service. She came up to me. She says, you know what? I need some advice. I really like that you don't hold back. And I said, you know why? I'm, I'm an introvert, so I have friends, probably all the friends I need. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I don't want to be friends with you. It means I didn't come to Idaho Falls because I needed more friends. Right? I got friends I've had for 20, 30 years. We still text. We still talk. I came because I was convinced in my heart. God was saying, I want you to go there and I want you to teach my word. I've got a new season for this church. And so we're going to move into that season and I want you to bring the word of God to them. And that was, that was my, my motivation. I would not have come here if I was not convinced of that truth. So I'm not trying to persuade because my ego needs it. I'm not trying to persuade... But I do believe, honestly, if God prepared my heart and my wife's heart and my daughter's heart, that he's preparing some hearts out here too. And God is saying, look, I want you to elevate so that by the end, if Jesus doesn't come, look guys, if Jesus doesn't come or call, call me home and, and you home before the end of this year, do I want to elevate to a higher level of usefulness for God my Father, for Jesus Christ, to use me as a servant in the midst of what he wants to do. Because there's only two possibilities. There's only two possibilities. Either God wants to do something or he doesn't. If he doesn't want to do anything, what are we doing? Like, why are we here? If God doesn't want to do anything, but just have us come to church on Sundays and just, you know, maybe give him some kind of perfunctory, you know, now I lay me down to sleep prayer and, and bless the food. If that's all he's calling us to do, what are we doing? Because we can do that without the church. But... If God is calling us to elevate to a level that we can't accomplish in our own strength, then we need his word. We need the body, the, the body of Christ. We need our brothers and sisters. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. Every year, around this time of year, man, gyms love January 1st. Gyms like, because they'll sell you like half price year membership because you're only going to go twice, right? <laughs> they know that because that's a resolution. I'm just going to go twice or something. And so that. If everybody who bought a gym membership on January 1st like showed up every, like, every other day to the gym, they'd run out. They wouldn't have machines. They'd have a line out the door. They know they're going to come once or twice. Nope, ain't doing this. They're going to come. They're going to get one workout. They're going to feel good. They're going to wake up the next day. No, nope, mm-mm, mm-mm, done, done. They ain't going to take, hey, look, uh, <laughs> I like a refund, please. They, they know they ain't going to do that. So they just got all your money because that's a resolution. God is calling us to commit. If you're old enough, you remember the, the, the first Iraq war. And, and all the lead up, whether you agree or disagree, not the issue, but you, you, this, just the history of it. The UN made probably dozens of resolutions. You got to do this. You got to do that. You, you've got to get rid of your chemical weapons. You've got to allow UN inspectors. I mean, they like made a dozen resolutions. And you know what it accomplished? Nothing. Nothing. It took the use of force. It took the use of force. And that's why Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. Well, what does he mean? What he means is, this kind of passive passivity towards, towards the things of God doesn't fly. Look at the people that impressed Jesus. Remember that woman with the issue of blood? As she's like, at, this is the craziest place to be in a crowd, where you're down to get the hem of his garment, because you can get, you get trampled to death. That's where people die. When I think of Zacchaeus climbing a tree, right? People already hated him. Now they're just going to make fun of him. He climbed a tree. You know, the, the, the Bible says he, he being a short man. 
And, and the, the interesting thing is the average height for a Jew was about 5'3". The average height for a Roman was about 5'1". So, yeah, so by the way, if you make fun of me for being short, Jesus is like, yeah. He'll be like, hey, funny guy, tell me that, tell me another joke. Tell me another. Because the Bible says there wasn't anything about his physical appearance that was unusual. So, so here's this, thing, here's this, this guy who's, who's by the standards of his day, a little dude, can't see over the crowd. I mean, can you imagine this guy? So he climbs a tree. He know everybody's going to make fun of you, you climbing a tree. He does it anyway. Remember the two blind guys? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd's like, shut up, man. We're having our parade. The Bible says they cried out all the louder. Remember the centurion? I'm not worthy to have you under my roof, Jesus. Just say the word. and I'm... Jesus was impressed by people who exercise real faith. I'm going to close with this. There was a guy named Chuck. And Chuck was, um, he was a, a town councilman in the town I was pastoring in in Massachusetts, and he was married to a woman who was not only an unbeliever, she was just like very, very against the things of, of the Lord. And he, Chuck went to a church uh, in, in the next, because we, we were pastoring a little town of about 7,000, so there was a bigger town just about 20 minutes away, and he went to an Assemblies of God church in that town. But every now and then, maybe the weather was bad or whatever, he would come and he'd join us. So one day I'm preaching, I finished up the sermon. I probably mentioned that, that story about the, the two blind men. Chuck comes down to, the, down to the altar. And he just starts crying out, Jesus! Top of his voice. It's uncomfortable. Here's this guy who's this dignified, right? I mean, he's, he's this important person in town. People know him. And, and half the church is like, this guy don't even go to our church. And he's just crying out passionately, to Jesus because he's just, he, he's at the end of his rope. What do I do? I don't know what I'm supposed to do in my household. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to, to just go to that next level. And Jesus said, you know what? Being passive is not going to impress me. Being lukewarm is not going impre to impress me. Passionately going after my purposes. So here's what I want to ask as we get ready to, to close. I want you to think of just one thing. Just one thing. I want you to think of, of your life because we could get overwhelmed with everything. Like, if God told me right now everything is still wrong with me, I'd probably want to quit. I'm like, I'm never going to fix it. But think of one thing. What do you want to characterize your life by this time next year that doesn't now? Do you want people to say, that is a, a woman of prayer? Do you want people to say, that is a generous God. Do you want people to say, that, that's, a, that's a husband and a father that leads his home. He's the first one in the church. He's the first one with his hands raised in worship. What doesn't characterize your life now that you would like to see it? Because some of us, we're like afraid to take that step. We're like, man, people think I'm weird. People think I'm messy. They already do. You just, they don't, they just like you not too much to tell you. But right now, maybe it's just a notion. Maybe it's even an idea or a resolution. What would it take to make it a habit. The Bible says Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. Remember Daniel? And, and they passed this law that you're not allowed to pray to any God. And he goes up to his room and, and, and he prays with the windows open three times a day as was his custom. There were just things that characterized his life. And if there's parts of your life that are not like Jesus, that you want to be like Jesus, start with one. My prayer life, my faithfulness, my time in the Word. Just some dynamic, some characteristic that I can develop in my life so that I can be a more useful servant of God. I'm not going to tell myself, if I become more prayerful, I'll become more holy. Right? That, that's just self-righteousness. I want to become these things so that I become more useful. Come on, let's stand together. God, you are such a good and patient God. You put up with all of my junk and you still love me. You see every way that I fail and yet you still call me higher. You see how often I rely on my own strength and my own flesh and you still offer me your spirit and your power and your grace. So Father, I worship you. 
Not just for the challenge, Lord. Not just for the call to elevate, but I, call, I, I just worship you, God, because you call me to these places knowing that in my own strength, I'll never in a million years get there. But that if I begin to walk towards you, Lord, you'll give me the strength. You'll give me the power. If I will commit, if I will do what's possible for me to do, you'll do what's possible for only you to do. Jesus, you told me, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You told me that the heavenly father knows that I need all these things, that I'm concerned with these things. But she said, if I'll follow you and I'll seek your kingdom first, you'll supply the things that I concern myself with so that I can concern myself with your kingdom. Lord, I pray for somebody in this place today that your Holy Spirit would reveal an area that they can come down to this altar and they can commit on January 1st, 2023. I am going to, over these next 365 days, I am going to become more whatever it is you tell them. And church, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, if the Spirit of God is prompting you, if the Spirit of God is calling you to elevate, come to this altar as this praise team ministers. Let me agree with you and believe that God will do it to bring glory to his name and to make you more like his son. Amen.